the introduction of Pinnacle, there's several who have been to previous uh, webinars and attended previous presentations that we've given here at Pinnacle. Just very quickly, for those of you who don't know and are unaware, a Pinnacle Health Informatics is a data management firm for healthcare. We've been doing this since the early 2000s. And we are um, focusing mainly on data warehousing and building analytical tools for healthcare, data integration, performance management. We work a lot with what's called CCBHC here in the United States, which are performance metrics for behavioral health. We focus heavily on OLAP, online, online analytic, analytical processing, DAX, MDX, TSQL, for areas of data manipulation and uh, data visualization. Um, and one direction we want to get, we want to move in and, and be more active in in the future is, of course, uh, using Python and some of the data science tools that are available um, to us. And so we want to begin begin moving in that direction. And uh, we're being advised by, by Matt, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I, we wanted to introduce Python to our existing clients and, and those that have interest in learning more about Python. And so we've invited Matt today, which is a real pleasure to have him. And uh, it's a it's a real uh, really an honor uh, to have him uh, assist us today. So we're very excited, Matt. And he'll he'll provide some more background on himself. Matt is the founder of MetaSnake.com, a data science consultant and corporate trainer. And he lectures at conferences internationally. It's always interesting to hear about his travels and what companies he has um, trained with or provided consulting services to. And it's quite a, a broad and a diverse group. Uh, author of numerous books on Python and data science. I have my copy, which just arrived, of Effective Pandas from Amazon. So that was, uh, that was great to receive that. And he attended Stanford University. So we're really pleased to have him here today. We're looking forward to his presentation. We'll have some time at the end for questions. If anyone has a question in the meantime, uh, please feel free to post that. We'll try to get that answered. Um, with that, and without any further ado, we'll hand it over to Matt. Good morning, Matt. Hey there. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get going here. Okay, so hopefully you can you can see my screen here. Um, I I um, I'm excited to be here. Thanks thanks for inviting me, Sean. I, I also have my copy of Effective Pandas. Um, I'll, I'll note that usually only my mom calls me Matthew, but uh, I guess Sean can call me Matthew. But that's okay. So let's get started here. Um, Hopefully you can see my slides, uh, which are not really slides per se, but are, are more uh, a notebook, a Jupyter notebook. So it's great to have people from all over the world here. Got um, a couple people from Colombia, Cubo, all those from Colombia. I used to live in Colombia. I lived in Colombia for two years, so it's excited to be here. Excited for you to be here. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I basically make my living, as Sean mentioned, selling snake oil. So I run a company called MetaSnake. Uh, MetaSnake uh, does corporate training consulting. So as was mentioned, I, I have a Stanford degree. I've been using Python for about 20 years, mostly in the data side. And I've written multiple books and consulted with multiple companies uh, on Python and data science. So what, what I wanna do today, let me bump up the font here so it's a, uh, you can maybe see it a little bit better. Um, what I wanna do today, is to talk about you know what is Python. I imagine most of you are pretty familiar with that. Um, who's using Python, uh, what they're doing with it, what you shouldn't be doing with it and how to leverage it. And then I, I think we'll have time, we'll, we'll throw in a demo after that. So I think you'll really like the demo there. So Python is a high level language. It's actually not a new language. It's older than Java. It was created in 1990, it is open source. So one of the nice things about that, it's freely available. You can go grab it. You don't have to pay for it. Um, there's also a large community that's working on it. Um, 
in addition to the community that's working on Python, there's a large community of developers working on tools for Python. So one of the nice things about Python is, is once you adopt this platform, you basically are standing on the shoulders of giants. You get access to about 350,000 plus packages that you can leverage on top of Python. And so I'm gonna be showing some of those a little bit later today. Um, Probably the top language taught in schools these days, uh, number one language for data scientists and very popular for other applications as well. Uh, oftentimes people have said it's the second best language for everything. Um, I, I, so people who, who know me know that even though, like I said, I sell snake oil for a living, I think it does a disservice to um, to those who I'm, I'm working with or training to say that everything is peaches and cream in Python land. Uh, there, you know, this is an old language, it was made in 1990, right? So there are, there are things that, you know, if Python were designed today, it might be a little bit different, but it, it is where we are right now. So uh, people say it's the second best language to do almost everything in, which is, is kind of nice. Like if you wanna do data science, you can use Python. If you wanna make a web app, you can use Python. If you want control, servers, you can use Python. So there are other tools that allow you to do those things, but generally there aren't other tools that cross those domains, if that makes sense. Like Java's pretty good for backends, JavaScript's pretty good for backends and frontends, but really doesn't have any uh, data story at all. And so Py Python is a language that, you know, covers a large area and uh, it, for that reason is very popular. Who is using Python these days? Uh, um, basically everyone. I mean, what do I mean by everyone? I mean, NASA's using it, Microsoft's using it, Google's using it, Facebook or Meta or whatever they're called is using it, Apple's using it. So the largest companies in the world are using it. A lot of startups are using it. And it's a great tool to have right now. Um, so what are they using it for? Again, I, I mentioned some of these. If, if you're working with the cloud, Python is a great tool to work with the cloud. If you want to embed logic in a program, Python is a great tool to do that. You see a lot of vendors who sell fancy, complicated programs. And in, in the past, they had you know, customized scripting languages for these. Most of these vendors have now dropped their customized scripting language and moved to Python just because why not leverage a language that everyone knows and everyone is learning? And, and again, you, you get access to a lot of things for free when you do that. It's also being used for Internet of Things microcontrollers. So I've got a, up on my shelf back here, I've got a bunch of little devices that you can run Python on, right? And so not just powerful supercomputers, but all, all the way down to, you know, little teeny uh, things the size of business cards that you can run Python on. Uh, like I said before, great for web applications, data science being used all over the place for data science, some of the most advanced applications in the world. And it's also used for teaching as well. So why would you maybe not want to use Python? And uh, like I said, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Python, but there are places where you might not want to use it. And, and if I were to tell you to use it in those places, uh, I think that would reflect poorly on me. So you know, Python is a slow language. It's not a fast language. So you might think that's kind of weird. Why, why is it used in data science, which is a ton of number crunching if Python is slow? Well, due to libraries like NumPy, NumPy is basically an abstraction that allows you to basically write C-speed code using Python. So leveraging libraries that abstract things but make things leverage modern computer architectures, you can basically get very fast speed, close to C-speed by writing Python code. And you have libraries like Pandas and NumPy or Pandas and Scikit-learn and SciPy that are built on top of this. And there's a whole ecosystem that basically allows you to manipulate numbers very quickly. So again, I'm gonna be demoing some of that later. So that, that makes it, so we can use it for things like data science, number crunching. However, you know, if I was doing like a first person shooter app and I want to use the latest and greatest hardware and sort of eke out the performance of this, probably would not use Python to do that just because there is a boundary when you, you know, there are, you know, when you're in NumPy land, if you stay in that land, you're fast. But once you cross over the boundary, you might get slow again. So if you wanted to eke out and you had various logic that couldn't be represented by tools like NumPy, then you'd go back to the slow Python version. And, and so if I were to write a first person shooter, you know, 
fancy game like that, that want to eke out performance of everything on my machine, I would not use Python for that. Also, Python doesn't really have a strong phone app story. And I, I have done some phone development. Uh, you know, there are some cross-platform products, but generally most big uh, people who are making apps for their phone tend to, you know, write it twice, right? They write it once for Android and write it again uh, for iOS using native tooling rather than something like Python there. So there, there are things that try to do that, but again, I, I probably wouldn't bet my business on doing that in Python per se. And then there's things like this thing called the GIL, which is a global interpreter lock. This is an artifact of Python being, you know, kind of an ancient programming language and how computer architecture worked when Python was created. So it, this basically limits Python from scaling out to multiple cores, uh, even though it supports threats. So there are ways around this, and I'm not going to get into that today. But again, Python is not a perfect language, but it, it is a pretty good language, and it's very popular today. So how should you leverage Python if you're, if you're not leveraging it? Well, I mean, one thing is you can train up on that. Um, it, you know, if you have a business, you might think what, what makes business sense to leverage Python for. So if you have existing code and it works and you want to port it to Python just because you want to port your existing code to Python, I would say that probably doesn't make business sense, right? But if you have uh, something that you need to do some fancy analysis with, you want to leverage the, the latest techniques in machine learning, it, it would probably make sense to leverage Python to do that because again, Python is where the action is happening right now. You can certainly hire experts to do that. And by hire, I mean, try to like go out and, and uh, sign them to a job, right? So like the creator of Python uh, just came out of retirement to go work for Microsoft. I'm sure Microsoft offered him quite a bit of money and or stock to do that. Um, so that can be kind of difficult, right, to, to hire an expert or someone like that and uh, compete with Microsoft for that. Uh, certainly there are consultants, right, who, who will uh, help you get your Python up to speed. And another option is training up. And that's sort of, I, I'm sort of in those last two buckets. That's what I do. I, I generally go to big companies who have people who want to use Python or they want to use Python more effectively or they want to start telling lies with data and I help them do that. So like my Effective Pandas book is all about um, being able to not just know what Pandas does, but to, to take real world data and then use Pandas to apply analysis to that. Um, so just if, if people have questions, I'm happy to fill those. Um, I do have the chat up, so if you want to pop those in there, happy, happy to try and, and fill those questions if, if you have them. Uh, um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do now is just jump to a demo here um, after that brief overview of Python. And um, so at the end of 2000 on my Twitter, um, I had around 6,000 followers. And I decided at that point that uh, I think Twitter is an interesting platform. It's one way to scale out. Like I'm a small company, right? So how do I scale out my messaging? And Twitter is one way to do that, right? I can, I can broadcast information. And so uh, as of today, uh, we can pull up Twitter and see, see what, what it looks like today. Okay, so. Uh, as of today, I have 71,000 followers, right? So over uh, the course of a, a, I guess, about two years, um, um, sorry, this is the end of 2000. Twitter didn't exist in 2000, I meant 2020. Um, over the course of two years, I, I, I've got almost 60,000 followers, right? And so one of the things that I did before I started I say taking Twitter seriously is I did some analysis on Twitter uh, of, of my Twitter usage. And so I, I want to walk you through some of that, uh, what you can do with Python and some of the tools around Python. Um, Ricardo asked, does effective pandas cover ML? Um, it has an example of ML, but it doesn't go into that. Um, I, I, I happen to have written another book called Machine Learning Pocket Reference, which uh, 
does cover uh, uh, a lot of ML uh, tabular manipulation for that. Okay, so let, let's let's go through this little analysis. I just want to uh, sort of show you some of the things that you can do with Python here. So I'm going to load a library called Pandas, and that's what my most recent book was. But Pandas, in short, is a library that allows you to manipulate tabular data. So I'm going to load that up. It's written on top of NumPy. So if you use it effectively, you can basically get a very quick analysis here. So I'm going to load up uh, my raw data set. This is my Twitter data, and it looks something like this. So you can see that I've got like a permalink, a tweet text, and then like impressions and how many times people engaged and a bunch of promoted stuff that doesn't have any information in there. So this is some of the data that I want to analyze here. So I'm gonna show you some of the things that you can do. Uh, one of the things that you can do is you can, you know, just inspect your data here. So here, here is my data frame here. And that's what we call this tabular representation here. And I'm going to ask it how much memory each column is using. That's something that you might wanna be aware of just to, due to the nature of how Pandas works. And this returns a thing called a series, which you can think of as a column from that data frame here. And if I wanna sum that up, I just say sum on that. This tells me the number of bytes that this is using. So this looks like I've got like four megabytes of data here. So not a particularly large data set. Um, but I'm, I probably wanna clean this up a lot of time. I mean, if you look at, you know, how people use machine learning. And I've done a lot of predictive modeling and consulting around machine learning. And, and generally when people say, can you make a model to do that? Generally the answer is, yeah, you can make a model to do that. Um, the question is, uh, you know, is the model useful? And that's a little bit harder to, to, to realize. And the problem with it generally is because you have to prep the data and get into a place where you can start modeling it. And so just because I have my raw data and Twitter provides raw data does not necessarily mean that your data is in a place that you can throw it into machine learning. Um, so what I, what I have on here on, on this example here is just some, some steps that I've taken to clean up my Twitter data here. So I'll, I'll just sort of walk through these maybe, um, and, and, and this is a thing called chaining. So this reads like a recipe. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my data frame, there's my data frame. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rename the columns. So the columns have spaces in them. You can have columns with spaces in them. It just makes it a little bit more annoying to do some things. So I'm gonna rename those and get rid of the space. You can see the spaces went to underscores after that. Uh, so tweet underscore ID. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop some columns if they have promoted in them. If, if you notice, there are a bunch of promoted columns. I don't, I don't promote things on Twitter using their platform. Uh, so I don't have any information in that. So I'm just going to drop that. And uh, if I now scroll over here, you can see that there aren't any promoted columns. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to drop some more columns. So I've, I've got some other columns in here that I want to drop. So I'll, I'll just drop those as well. And the next, whoops. And the next thing I want to do is I want to make some new columns or update some columns. So I'm going to make a column called impressions, just converting the impressions column to a, a unsigned int 32. So by default, Panda is going to use a int 64. So I'm just going to do that. And you can see that that gives me that back. Uh, same thing for engagements. I'm going to change the type of engagements. Then I've got a thing called a dictionary comprehension here. I'm just going to change a bunch of types to uint 8. Basically, the intent here is to save some memory. I'm going to change some other things to uint 16. So we'll just run that, make sure that works. I'm going to change this permalink to a categorical uh, looks like that works. And then I'm going to come down and just look at my memory usage and sum that up. So we were at, th uh, th uh, what were we at? Four megs, I think. Yeah, we were at four megs and now we're at like 1.9 megs. So this cleanup has not only made my data a little bit better, but also it's using about half the space now. So I can go through steps like this to clean it up. Um, and so after I've done something like that, uh, one of the nice things about pandas is, is I can come to a notebook like this and I can clean up my data. If my boss asked me like, where did this data come from? I have this recipe and I can just track my data through that and figure out what's going on. So I'll generally have something like this at the top of a notebook and then I'll load my raw data 
And then I'll have a function like this right after this to clean this up. So this is a little bit more involved. I've got a few more columns here. I'm creating some features from my columns. Like I wanted to know, you know, what time of day I tweeted at, whether I'm replying to something, the length of that. I had heard that if you have longer tweets, people like them more. Uh, so I have the number of words. I also have Unicode. I heard that if you include Unicode in your tweets, that people like them more, uh, the hour, the day of the month, the day of the week, uh, whether it's an at tweet, uh, if it has new lines, how many lines it has, how many people it mentions, and if it has hashtags. So you can run that and uh, create your new data here. So this, again, is creating from my raw data, this new data set. Okay, so there are some questions here. Let me, let me uh, maybe go through these questions here, and then I, I've got a little bit more on my de demo that I'd like to go through. So, Um, uh, Ricardo asked, as, so I think I answered Ricardo's question. Tony says, I join late, will these notebooks be available to this, to us? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll either make these available to people who have effective pandas or work right away for Sean to get them available. Uh, a question here, who would you recommend? Who would you recommend your courses to versus the corresponding books you offer on the same topic? Are courses just more hands-on with exercises? Um, it's a great question. So I, I wrote a blog post about what I think are the most effective ways of learning. Um, I think books are great in that they take you through a path. Courses are also good as well. Courses tend to be a little bit less detailed and as you mentioned, a little bit more hands-on. So it, my personal take is that the most effective way to learn is with a trainer. And again, I'm completely biased because that's what I do for a living. But I, I've seen people who have been programming Python for years professionally go through like a three-day course and walk out of that saying, well, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I think that's the most effective, especially for teams. If you're on a team and you want to get your team leveled up, you have all these uh, knowledge mismatches. Uh, corporate training is definitely the best way to do that quickly. Uh, books and courses are also good. I think with, with books, you just need to make sure that you practice, right? And with a course, I mean, the same thing happens. My courses have labs and they have solutions for the labs, but you know, a lot of people don't do the labs. If you don't do the labs, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. So you, you need to figure out uh, what works for you and what's sort of the carrot that will incentivize you to learn this material. If you just read about it or watch me do it, but you never do it, um, it's going to be really hard for you to master these tools because uh, they can be a little bit complicated. Okay. Um, um, Evan says, VS Code Editor has a Jupyter Notebook extension. Observe that Jupyter Notebook on Anaconda is sometimes slow. Question, is VS Code uh, better than an option than Anaconda based on your experience? Um, I don't use VS Code, so I can't really comment on that. I mean, I know that like PyCharm has a Jupyter extension, VS Code has one, Emacs has one. Um, is this Evan? Yeah, Evans. Um, so Evans, I, I do a lot of training and I don't want to like push clients to say that you have to use VS Code. I, I, I think editors and environments are somewhat personal and sometimes there's business decisions around those. And so I think Jupyter is actually fine. I teach Jupyter, I've taught Jupyter thousands. It, it tends to work fine. I, I, I'm trying to think of cases where like VS Code would be faster than Jupyter. Um, it might do some things faster like uh, IntelliSense or something, but uh, the, the kernel should be the same kernel. Uh, let's see, here's another question. Um, something about Fedora, I'm not sure of that. Okay. Okay. Okay, great questions. Um, so let's go back to our demo here. We got our Twitter data it is cleaned up. So one thing is that you do want to do is you want to learn how to do aggregations, right? If, if you're doing an analysis, you know, loading the data and getting cleaned up is one thing, but you will want to be able to start diving into it, slicing and dicing it. You know, your boss is going to say, which, which months, what do our cells look like for month or by the week? You know, in, in my case, what do my tweets look like by the month, by the week? Um, and so anytime anyone says like by the or 
compared with, generally they're talking about doing some sort of aggregation. In, in Excel, we call this a pivot table. In uh, SQL, we call this a group by. So let's look at how we would do this using pandas. Pandas certainly can do this. So I've got my Twitter data. I'm gonna say, I want to find uh, what happens at the year level. So I'm gonna say, I wanna group by the year. I've got the time column. Note that this time column is just a date time, but using pandas, I can easily pull off the year from that. So I'm gonna group by the year and then I'm gonna take the mean. This is gonna give me back a data frame. In the left-hand side, you see the year and in each of the columns, you see all the numeric columns and their mean for that. Um, so uh, I've written this as four lines of code, but legitimately that you could write this on a single line. It's one line of code to do this. So once you have this construct and you understand this, you can start doing pretty fancy things. I can say, well, let's just look at the impressions by year. So here's the impressions by year. And you can see that uh, I had like three X amount of impressions in 2021 versus uh, 2020. Uh, and then you can do even fancier things. I'd say, I'm gonna group by the time column, but I wanna do this two month frequency and I'm gonna pull off impressions and replies. And uh, let's just pull off the median of that instead of the mean here. So that's what that looks like. We have impressions and replies at the two month frequency. You can see that this is January 31st, this is March 31st. But if I wanna look at like three month frequency, I just change that to a three and it's a three month frequency, or I can change that to six months or whatever and get those frequencies if I want to. If I want to change the columns I pull out, I can just change the columns I'm passing in. If instead of looking at the, the median, I want, the standard deviation, I can stick on the standard deviation. If I want to plot this, I just tack on a plot here at the end, and that uh, gives me a plot each column against the index there. So really powerful once you've got this figured out. You know, if you want to plot the mean, what the mean looks like, here is the mean uh, for each month. Whoops, there we go, here's the mean. So you can see that, uh, you know, somewhere around uh, this July, uh, crazy mean of impressions. And, and this is probably, uh, actually it, not probably, it is not normal data. So probably looking at the median would be a better metric for a central tendency there. And you can see that, you know, it looks like my impressions are going up over the past year. So that's good to know that uh, apparently something is working there. Now, I, I showed that you can say like one month, two months, three months. You can also do things like this where you say seven days and five hours. So if you do that, there you go. Here is one day, here's seven days and five hours later, right? And you can say mean or, or whatever aggregation you want. You can plot that if you want to. So this is the seven day, five hour uh, mean aggregation. Again, legitimately one line of code, but I've written it like this, it makes it really easy to debug and step through, figure out what's going on there. Um, here I'm gonna do another syntax for that. You can use pivot table instead. So if you're familiar with Excel, uh, Pandas does have the ability to, to do pivot tables, which is basically the group by, like I said, but we're gonna say in the index, we wanna stick in the time at the seven day, five hour frequency, whatever that is. And in columns, we're gonna stick in this is Unicode. Maybe I wanna look at how Unicode, remember I said someone told me that is Unicode, if something's Unicode, it tells you, gives you a better indication of um, uh, how people will respond to it, right? Uh, apparently more people will read it if it's Unicode. So I'm gonna pull off the impressions and replies and uh, our aggregation by default, the pivot table does a mean aggregation. So this is the mean of that. This is a table, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on in the table. Humans aren't optimized for looking at tables. So what we like to do is just um, plot it, right? We, we are better at looking at plots and there you go. And you can see here pretty clearly that uh, it looks like, you know, when I post uh, Unicode, I get better uh, impressions there. Now, again, this is using by default the mean, ag funk here. So if we want to look at median, we just come in here and say, look at the median instead and it tells a slightly different story. So apparently I have some outlier data that is Unicode that gets a lot of views, right? But it gets a little bit fuzzier here. Um, if we look at this uh, going down here at the seven day level. Okay, so here is the one day level. You can see that I can just aggregate this at the one day level and you can see, yeah, there is like 
one day that I got half a million views on something, right? So that is an outlier event that's going to throw off that cent central tendency there. Um, now, you, you see people who will do plots like this, you know, oftentimes it is useful to have like the seven day or, you know, the daily information, right? You, especially with like COVID, this is very popular to see people plotting the daily information for COVID, but you do have spikes. Like, for example, the COVID information in Utah, when they would report on testing, they wouldn't at, on the weekends, they wouldn't include that data. So the weekends would go down and then Monday would skyrocket and it would be a little bit weird. So, you know, if you have data like this, where you've got is bumpy, how do you smooth it out? Well, again, you can do this in pandas uh, relatively easily here. So uh, let me just uh, show you, whoops. Let me just walk through this. Okay, so here's our pivot table with our impressions, right? And we've got some missing values in there. So I'm just gonna say fill in the missing values with zero. Um, and then if we want to plot this, this is what we have above there, that daily frequency. But what we can do instead is we can say, okay, let's do a seven day rolling average on top of that. All I have to do is tack on a rolling here and then tack on mean. And if you look at this now, the first, couple entries are blank because it has to take seven of those to calculate that, but then uh, it's going to give us the seven day rolling average. And if we plot this now versus the old one, you can see that that's smoothed out quite a bit. Now it's maybe still a little bit hard to see. Maybe we do want to zoom into this so we can use some pandas to say, I want to slice off the index values that go from uh, uh, June through September of 2021. And if you do that, you can see that there is June through September of 2021. So we, we built up this chain of operations. Again, legitimately one line of code, but I write it this way so we can read it as recipe step by step by step. Okay, um, let's break and take some more questions here. And then I think uh, we'll do a, a little machine learning demo as well. Um, looks like we've got one more question. How come some functions need single quotes, but others need square brackets, like in the pivot tables with value arguments? Yeah, so that's, that's um, like I said, um, you know, I, I make my money like teaching these things, but I'm not going to say that like the syntax here is necessarily like the easiest thing to master. So this is leveraging features of the program language Python. And so Python has a notion of an index. It also has a notion of a method. And so sometimes in pandas, we use an index to slice things out. Sometimes we use a method instead. So, you know, if I were designing this, I probably wouldn't use slicing. I'd just use everything from methods just because a lot of the people who I work with aren't programmers and don't necessarily want to be programmers. You know, after uh, a little bit of training, it's it's not too hard for them. But yeah, there, there is some, I guess, programmatic jargon in there that you have to get used to. Um, let's see what else. Um, yeah. So another thing uh, on, on that note, maybe, Jared, uh, another thing is that... Uh, okay. Hopefully you can still see me. Can you still see me or am I frozen? Sean, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Your, okay. your video is frozen, but I can hear you. Okay, it looks like my video is frozen. Okay. Um, I'll keep talking. Hopefully you can uh, hear me. And let me switch my video here. Not sure what happened to my video. Okay, so ho hopefully you can see me now with the side view here. Um, so, sorry about that. Uh, let's see the questions here. Um, so we, we answered that one about syntax. Uh, Jose says, you mentioned everyone is using Python. It's the language of universities are, are teaching. Do you have any advice how to remain competitive when there's a lot of Python developers? Um, so great question, Jose. Generally, the, the I mean, I'd say if you're looking to get into like data science or development, you're gonna have to bite the bullet and just realize that you're always gonna have to be learning. 
So unless you want to be like stuck in doing COBOL or something, there's always going to be new stuff to learn. So um, what do I say? I say focus on, you have to look at it as an investment from my point of view, right? Where should I spend my time? Where will it make sense to spend my time? And maybe you couple that with your interests and the business interests. Hopefully your business is providing you some sort of training so that you are competitive. From my point of view, that's in their best interest to make it so that uh, their, their people are, are using modern tooling and know how to use it effectively, right? Um, it's kind of investing in training. It, it has a very high return on investment because people can be really productive afterwards. Um, let's see. Okay, a lot of people are said I'm frozen. So hopefully you can see, see me now. Um, let's see. Mokdar says a question. Have you ever tried to embed Jupyter Notebook that does Python analytics on a website for learners to experiment? Um, I'm, I mean, I use Jupyter for training all the time, uh, Mokdar. So I guess, yes. Um, find the COBOL pipeline for Python. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's a good point. Um, let's see, uh, Greg says, do you normalize your data often? Was that included in your chained operation? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by normalize, Greg, since that has a specific meaning for statisticians. Um, but I didn't really change uh, the values in the data. We're going to do some machine learning in a moment here. And so I am going to standardize the data uh, to get that. Um, Evan says, what st stats book do I recommend? Um, if you want to be a statistician, then you should look into stats. Um, so I, I'm not a statistician and um, I, I'm a programmer by trade. So I think you should have a basic stats understanding, but I, I don't know that um, in, unless you're looking to be a statistician, I don't know that you need to have deep statistical understanding. I think it's good to be a subject matter expert in your data and have some basic stats and know how to uh, do visualizations and, and do some summaries. But um, unless you're looking to be a statistician, I wouldn't dive too deep into stats personally. Um, Abdul says, how to be good in ML who doesn't have much experience in math. I mean, this is sort of similar to the stats question, Abdul. I mean, people look at this from different ways. Some people are like, you need to have deep understanding of math, do machine learning. Uh, the truth is, is that the libraries are all out there. They're implemented. Someone's done the math for you. Um, I mean, I actually had this conversation on Twitter this morning. Like, uh, so the last time I used calculus, is tutoring my kids in calculus, right? I mean, I, I learned calculus in 1993 and I've never used it for work, right? So does that mean that you'll never use calculus? No, but I mean, sample size one, but um, you know, if you want to get into data science, I don't, I don't think you need to have uh, strong math per se. I mean, I think it is good to understand the math. You can understand the linear algebra, what's going on or, the calculus of gradient descent, but someone's already implemented that for you. So if you have an understanding and you know how to evaluate your models and your models make sense from a business case, for me, that's where the money is, not that you can like um, claim some statistical or mathematical rigor about what you're implementing. I mean, if it makes you money, um, I think that's where, where the value lies. Um, Jake, focus on the outcome you need to achieve the language is a syntax. A great program in language X might not be the one that's most competitive to deliver the outcomes. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Jake. Um, Ricardo says, what would you recommend for people getting started in data science analysis? Um, again, I'm highly biased there, Ricardo, right? I mean, I write courses on, on that, on getting started with programming, getting started with data science. So at a high level, you need to know how to program, right? You need to understand uh, you know, data science and analytics, it's pretty wide space. You need to know what you want to do in that. And, uh, you know, it's getting more and more, I guess, specialized as we speak. So talk to someone who knows what, 
who is doing what you want to do and, and maybe ask them for hints on how to get into that. But yeah, at a, at a minimal, you need to program, you need to have basic understanding of algorithms and what they're doing. And then you need to have a portfolio. Um, Ed says, posted this on Twitter, but a couple of years ago, the hacker rank test to be a data scientist at Walmart had a calculus question. Um, also probability encoding questions. Yeah, and I'm, so if you, and, and my stats there was like, if you wanna be a data scientist, right? Then maybe you need to understand the stats more. I mean, I've done data science for almost 20 years and, you know, depending on which niche you're niching down into, you might have more statistical rigor in there. But like I said, a lot of times the libraries are implemented for you, or if you know how to uh, program, you can go out and read the papers and implement the libraries. So like I wrote a program that did survival analysis uh, for a hardware company. I'm not a statistician, right? But I went out and did that, or I did statistical process control for the same hardware company, I'm not a statistician, but I went out and read the book and it was relatively easy to implement. So, you know, if you, if you can implement those, if they don't exist now, nowadays those exist, they didn't exist when I was doing that a few years back. Um, Brian says, can you explain the options and getting versus, can you explain the options versus getting specialized in the field now? I, I think Brian's question is explaining, let me try and summarize, uh, should, should you get a job in data science that's broad or do you want to niche down? Is, is that sort of what you're asking, Brian? I, I mean, starting off is always hard, right? Starting off as a programmer is hard. Starting off in data science is hard, right? So you need to get your foot in the door some way. The best way to get foot in the door is to have a portfolio and be able to talk intelligently about that. I think for both programming and data science, um, and then just realize that, you know, a lot of these things are numbers games. You know, someone mentioned, yeah, if you interview at Walmart, they're going to ask you about calculus. Yeah, you can ask 10 people what data science means and you'll get 10 different answers, right? So um, just realize that, like, if you fail a data science test or a programming test, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person, or you're a bad programmer, or a bad data scientist. It just means that, um, you know, maybe their, their test didn't jive with your knowledge, right? Does that mean that their, their test is testing the right things? Uh, maybe not. I mean, I've failed multiple programming interview types as well. So that just comes with the territory and, and realizing that you, it's always learning. Okay. Uh, Renee says, in this notebook, use Matplotlib, but which other library do you prefer? For example, Bokeh for visualizations. I actually working on a course right now, Renee, that uh, uses Plotly for visualizations. So I'm going to show some examples here in a minute that uh, use Matplotlib that would probably be better in Plotly. But um, uh, yeah, I, I could rant on that for, for a moment. Matplotlib's great for, for visualizations that you want to print. So like my book here um, has a bunch of images in it and those were done with, with Matplotlib because it's, it's great for that. It's a little bit less good for interactive. Um, and Juan, do you know of any group where I can share my code to to receive feedback and improve it. Sure, I mean, just post your code on Twitter and, and say that it's the best code ever and then people will critique it. Um, so that's, I mean, sort of tongue in mouth. Um, but uh, yeah, Twitter, you're gonna find haters on Twitter and um, I post code on Twitter all the time. People say they like it. Other people say like they'd never work with me, that sort of thing. Um, I, Generally though, uh, Juan, I think a meetup is great for that. Um, finding someone locally in person can be really good. So, I mean, prior to COVID we had meetups. Uh, I think some of those are starting up now. So if you can find someone in person, local, that tends to be pretty good or someone at your work. Um, okay. Uh, so some, uh, Mokhtar says, I actually teach data science or Python and Pandas where I live in Senegal. What tech stack do you recommend right now from Pandas to Matplotlib NumPy? I mean, the basics. Um, 
again, you're always going to be learning, but the basics are there and the basics are what people are using. So I, I don't think you can go wrong with pandas and matplotlib right now. And, and if you need to learn something else, if you've learned those, you, you'll be able to learn something else. Uh, Sanders, I want to become a data analyst. Is learning pandas enough or should I learn PySpark as well? Um, so I've never had to use, I've written a course on PySpark, but I've never used it. Like none of my clients have ever asked me for that. Doesn't mean that it's not useful. I mean, certainly there's a huge company around PySpark or Spark. So it doesn't mean that, that there's not um, utility for it. Um, so so my, my answer maybe would be, you know, do you need to learn PySpark? If the jobs that you're looking at that you're interested in, I'll say that they want PySpark with them, then I would learn PySpark, right? But if, if you just think I'm going to go out and learn this because it will help me get a job and you don't know if that job requires that, I mean, for me, learning PySpark is an investment, right? So I want to invest my time into things that will pay off. And so maybe go out and research what jobs you want to do and see if PySpark is a requirement for those before spending a lot of time doing that. Um, uh, Sean says, be a presenter. M meet up, maybe be a presenter. Maybe we can do this now. <laughs> I, I think Sean is saying that someone should post their code and let me critique it right now. Um, um, I'm not quite sure, but... Uh, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to my code here. We we still got a little bit of time, so I want to give my machine learning demo here. So uh, I'm gonna be using uh, Scikit Learn, and um, we're going to be doing what's called principal component analysis. The idea here is if you look at my data, I've got you know uh, I, I don't know how many columns I have here. Let's look at it. Uh, Twitdf.shape. Okay, so I've got 30 columns here. Uh, humans aren't great at visualizing high dimensional data. Uh, you know, I can visualize 2D pretty well. 3D, mm, okay. Anything above 2D is kind of hard to visualize, especially because you're like putting it back onto like a two dimensional plane. So, you know, we've, we've got uh, quite a bit more than 2D here. How could we visualize this? And one of the techniques I like to use is called principal component analysis, I'm basically using linear algebra to do. Uh, a linear combination of the columns that make up the, the most information. So I'm not going to jump through this code too much here, but I'm going to um, take my data frame here. I'm going to drop a few columns that have text. Most machine learning algorithms don't really like to work with raw text. And then there's a question about normalizing my code. I'm going to stand, I'm going to do what's called standardizing it. It has a specific meaning for, for statisticians. It means you give it a mean value of zero and a standard deviation of one. Uh, this is coming from the scikit-learn library. I'm going to stick this back into a pandas data frame. And, and then I'm going to, after I do that, I'm going to run PCA. This is also coming from the scikit-learn library. And I'm going to get this XPCA thing out of that. So that looks like it ran fine. Uh, the output looks like this. So I have the principal components for each row. So these are, each row here is a tweet and I have the principal components. So it says principal component. Uh, zero, that should be, uh, that's Python is zero based language. So most statisticians or machine learning people would call that principal component one. Um, but, but those are the principal components. What this is, is it is a linear combination of the weights and the original columns uh, that represent the most variance. So that might be a little bit hard, but I'm not going to get into the algorithm too much here, but uh, you can check out the math if you want to. But one of the nice things about this is that you can use this for dimension reduction. Remember, we have a lot of dimensions here. And I can say, well, instead of having uh, 25 dimensions, if I want to capture like 80% of the information here, I only have to use like six or seven columns. And I capture that. Um, it, it turns out that if you look at like the first two columns, uh, you're getting like almost 50% of the information just by the first two columns of that. So what I can do is with that information, I can look at the weights. So when you calculate principal component, you also get the weights that are associated with them. And the weights are what, what you would multiply each value from and sum those up to get the principal components. And if you think about this, we've standardized the columns there 
So the weight that is the highest means that that column has more impact for the principal component. So here's principal component one, the weights of these, and they can be negative or positive. But basically the tallest bars here, either negative or positive, mean that those components have the most influence on that weight. So you can see that our first principal component is composed mainly of like engagements, impressions, uh, the red thing, retweets, uh, brown and purple, likes, user profile clicks, uh, light blue and blue. Uh, expands and follows. So it looks like principal component one is a representation or a proxy for how successful a tweet was. You can see these other ones where there is not much weight here. Now there is something that is negative here, but it's a slight negative, like whether something is a reply or not. Now let's look at principal component two. Principal component two, the big thing here is this red one, which is whether something is a reply. Um, we also see a blue down here, which is an at tweet. So replies and at tweets are similar. Then we see some bars going in the negative direction. That means that they, uh, you know, if something is a reply, apparently um, the length is uh, at, at odds with replies. So apparently if I have a reply, it will be short um, is basically what I'm saying. Uh, also, uh, yeah, so this looks like the second one is whether something is a reply or the, the length is also so, sort of a proxy for that. Interesting. So interesting thing about this principal component analysis is like, we just fed the data into this algorithm and it comes out and says the most important thing in your data is basically, or, or what represents this component here is basically how popular a tweet is for principal component one, what represents principal component two, which has the second uh, most, uh, the second uh, leading amount of information in there is basically the length or whether it's an at reply. So what I can do is I can plot this now and you can do a scatter plot here. So this is basically representing almost 20 dimensions in two dimensions here. So again, the X axis is how successful something is. This Y axis is whether something is a reply or the length of it. And you can see that we have uh, these little dots here, which look like outliers. And remember, there were outliers in my tweets, right? Some of those tweets that got to half a million views, right? Which would be this one right here. Um, yeah, that's gonna push out that quite a bit because if this is representing, if this X direction is representing views, that is an outlier and it's gonna pull that out. So what I can do after I make this plot and this plot is all done with pandas, um, I can color it. I'm gonna say, let's color it, uh, whether it is an at tweet. Okay, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and you can see that the top part, so this is, we're zooming into this area right in here. Um, this top part here is whether something was a response and then these other ones were replies. So that sort of breaks apart our tweets and let it, lets us be able to see them at that length. Uh, we can also color this by length. We saw that length was also a proxy there. And you can see that um, the lighter is the longer and the darker, or sorry, yellow is longer and purple is shorter. So I'm not zoomed in here, but if I zoomed in, we could, we could sort of see that a little bit better. Maybe let's copy this piece of code to zoom into that. And there you go, you can almost see like a smooth gradient sort of going down there. So shorter tweets on top and, and this top section up here, remember when we looked at this, you, you can sort of see this happening again. This top section is your replies. These are your non-replies and you can sort of see that uh, this is your replies and this is the long replies and the short replies and these are your non-replies. You can see uh, sort of a clustering going on there. Um, you can also see, uh, like if, we, if instead of doing length here, we did like impressions, we should see the coloring go in the other, in the X axis rather than the Y axis. And you can't really see that. All these are, are sort of lower impressions. If we spread this out a little bit, Yeah, still a little bit hard to see because those high impressions with that outlier behavior, uh, we're basically pinning that color down at that end. So it's a little bit hard to see. If we get rid of this, you will see that uh, there's the yellow, there's the green, here's the blue, right? And then everything over here is purple due to the outliers. Okay, and you can also like color this by hour. And if you look up at the weights here, um, hour is is this gray one here. And you can see that like, yeah, hour doesn't impact either of these principal components. And so if you color by hour, 
it doesn't impact those at all. So our, at least for the first two principal components was not particularly uh, important. So I think this is kind of cool. Again, I just threw the data into this. It's basically giving me a magic quadrant of like uh, responses, non-responses, uh, responses that um, tweets that had a lot of views, tweets that didn't have a lot of views. So this is cool. Um, it's a great way to sort of slice and dice and explore your data. And it's pretty easy to do this leveraging uh, Python there. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, questions here, if there are any. Oh, okay, Sean says, amplifying the point to go to a meetup, yeah. Um, Tomas says, when your data are in a database, in your opinion, what is better to analyze them with pandas, SQL, or mix uh, like DuckDB over pandas? Um, yeah, so it sort of depends on, on what your tool of choice is, Thomas. Um, I mean, I found that a lot of times in the real world, working with clients or whatnot, you have data in a database or you have data in Excel, right? And so at some point you need to pull that out. You know, whether you want to start slicing and dicing that in Excel or probably wouldn't slice and dice it in Excel, uh, whether you want to do that in SQL, uh, you might want to do that in SQL, like you might want to filter that down. Again, you just want to be aware. My, my thing, Tomas, is basically you want to be aware that when your boss asks you a question that you are able to track the lineage of the data and actually figure out what's going on there. And so uh, can SQL do a lot of what pandas can do? Yeah, it can. Can SQL do some things faster than pandas? Yeah, probably. Can SQL do some things that pandas can't? Mm, yeah, pandas can also do things that SQL can't, right? Or pandas makes a lot of things really easy that are painful to do in SQL. So, there is sort of a gray area where you could do one or the other, right? And so I, I think a lot of that is a business decision, you know, where your users are comfortable, where people are consuming this data are comfortable. And, uh, but I probably wouldn't make my models in SQL. Um, you, you could, right? You could embed some Python into your SQL database and, and run that, but I probably wouldn't do that. Uh, Matt, we had one question from Zach. I don't know, it, it didn't appear in the regular thread, but he, he just said, curious to know your thoughts on also taking the time to learn Julia for data science work. Yeah, um, that's a good question, Zach. I, I mean, people say like, should I use R or Java or, or C and, and maybe Julia? So again, Zach, I'm looking at this as an investment, right? And so, you know, can I learn R? Can I do a lot of the things that I can do with pandas or Python with R? Yeah, probably, I, at least from the data science side, I can, you know, if I want to start interacting with cloud servers or I want to write a website, it's going to be a pain to do that in R, right? And it's pretty simple to do that in Python. But also, uh, if you look at just like the number of jobs and, uh, you know, where things are headed, there's a lot more in Python than R right now. Now, your question about Julia is Julia is sort of like, here's a modern take on pandas or a numeric processing library or language that we can sort of start over from scratch and, and not have to deal with like Python's issues or whatnot. So should you learn Julia? I mean, from my point of view, if there's a business reason to, um, again, I don't see the jobs for Julia right now. Like if you went out and learned Julia, would you go out, be able to go out and get a job with it? Mm, I don't know, right? I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know anyone who, who's working with Julia in industry, not to say that you can't. I, I mean, I guess I know some people on on LinkedIn, but like people who I interact with, um, you know, and my connections are obviously pretty biased in the Python realm and also like here locally in Utah, I know a lot of companies or whatnot. Um, I, I don't know anyone who's using Julia at this point. So, I mean, it's something to keep your eye on. Um, but there is a lot of code in pandas right now. And I, I mean, maybe this is a little blunt, but you could say like pandas is sort of getting into like COBOL land where there's a lot of code. People don't necessarily want to migrate that code to Julia, even if Julia had the ability to do that. I mean, you're seeing tools like Modin, which is an implementation of pandas that like improves on pandas, but it's basically an implementation to the degree that they will like replicate bugs in pandas because there are large clients who are using pandas and they don't want to migrate to Julia, right? They, they want to keep all of their 
half million lines of pandas code working, they just want it to run faster. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's kind of how I would approach that as, as you know, looking at it as an investment. Okay, Jared says, uh, Julia seems to be for scientific computing, physics, climate. It does tabular data very well, it's specialized. Yeah. Um, Alistair says Python is useful in AWS cloud. Um, yeah, certainly. Uh, Renee says, what about Dask? So Dask, if you're not familiar with it, Dask is basically a way to scale out the computation of pandas. Pandas is what I call small data. You need to hold your data in memory. Dask lets you basically scale out to disk or to old other computers. So yeah, that certainly is an option. If you need to scale out, you can look at something like Dask or even this modem project or PySpark, right? Or Spark. Spark actually just came out with a pandas API. This is, I believe, their third attempt at like replicating the pandas API there. So certainly there are other options as well. Okay, uh, Ricardo, uh, Peter says, thanks for your book. Thanks, Peter, appreciate that. Uh, Ricardo says, what's your opinion on XGBoost versus Scikit-Learn? Um, I mean, at this point, Scikit-Learn basically has the histogram booster, which is basically an implementation of um, light uh, GBT, which is very similar to XGBoost. So you're getting, I mean, they're, they're not exactly the same, but they're very similar, right? So, and the other thing is, if you know how to use one, you can use the other, like the, the interface is the same. So my take on that would be, you know, try a model in both. And if the model performs slightly better next you boost or scikit-learn uh, and makes sense for your business, use that model. Uh, somewhat a pragmatic approach there. Okay. Um, so here is uh, my bias recommendation. Again, I, I've said that I'm pretty biased here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of live training, right? That's where I've seen people uh, really start to master these things. And you can basically cram a semester into three days and, and get very productive with that. Uh, after that, you know, I would supplement that with uh, interactive training like courses or books. Uh, to cover specific topics. And then, you know, if you're at a company and you, hopefully your company is investing in training and investing in learning, and you might want to, you know, start a center of excellence inside your company, right? And have brown bag lunches or Zoom calls, right? Where you do book clubs and discuss tools or libraries. So those are some, some recommendations if you want to start being a master of these things. Um, now, if, if you are interested, um, I do, like I said, I, I offer live training for Python and data science. Like I said, I've done this for NASA, Netflix, some of the biggest companies in the world. Happy to work with your company. If you're interested in that, uh, reach out for that. I also um, am offering consulting packages around pandas. So if, if you are interested in leveraging pandas and want to do some of the stuff that I've done here, um, feel free to reach out. Um, Metasnake is offering consulting packages around pandas. And then we are working with Pinnacle Health to uh, provide Python help informatics as well. You can contact me if you're interested in some of these offerings, Matt at Metasnake. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. You can find me there. As a bonus for everyone who stuck around here, uh, if you use this coupon, book20, and go to store.metasnake.com, that will get you 20% uh, off effective pandas. So with that, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, great questions here. I'll let Sean take us out of here. Thank you, Matt, so much. I think I speak for the group that this was a, an excellent use of our time. And uh, everyone, I think, got a lot out of it. So we sure appreciate everything, Matt. I've got my effective pandas. I'll probably be asking for an autograph uh, soon when I see you next time. So thank you. Um, up on the screen, I have got a list of the uh, of contact information for Matt, uh, his different uh, avenues of contact. Um, here at Pinnacle, we're excited to do more with we're excited to do more with uh, Python and looking forward to work more more with Matt in the future. We thank everyone for attending today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>